Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Virginia Blanton, one of the co-chairs of the English department, and I'm delighted to be here with you as we celebrate the life and work of Michelle Boisseau, a 22-year member of this department and this university. Um, she held other appointments before this, uh, but we're, we're going to really celebrate what she's done here at UMKC. And her, her life has been devoted um, the last 20 years to this institution in ways that have made us a phenomenal department, uh, an amazing university and place to work. Um, as one indication of this, you see a number of the poets that she helped bring to UMKC to showcase their work and allow our students to have an opportunity to meet national poets, to learn from them. Um, I, I want to say so much about Michelle. We all know many of the great things about her, um, including um, fierce determination to get what she wants. Uh, and because she had that drive and continues to have that drive, um, we are a better department. She has been instrumental in recruiting very, very good faculty and making sure that we so, uh, not only survived here, but succeeded and got promoted and became a, a really vibrant new version of the English department at UMKC. And she is instrumental in having created our MFA in creative writing and media arts. Um, in, in some ways, it's a collective effort. In another way, it was Michelle's heavy lifting that made that happen. Um, many, many poets of her stature would spend most of their time uh, in isolation, working on their work, <laughs> developing their craft, and a lot of that creative energy has gone into our department. And I'm ever mindful of that, um, that as a woman who has published five books of poetry, award-winning poetry, uh, a chapbook, has won countless awards, including her most recent Guggenheim, she, who knows what her luminosity would have been if she hadn't given us so much of her service time. So, sorry, um, I say that because I'm very aware of the many gifts she's given us. So, um, it's my great honor to host this event and thank you for coming. We, we are very glad you're here, and if you feel so moved and would like to read one of her poems, please do. If it's just being here in spirit, that's great too for those of you who are out there in the, um, in the verse, whatever verse, universe that's out there that is electronic. Um, and for those of you who are here who don't want to read but might want to send a message, we have a journal that was handmade by Jenny Frangos um, that will go to Michelle. You could, you could uh, doodle an a image for her. You could write her a poem. You could send her a note. I know she'd be delighted to have those. Um, and it, it, it's going to operate as a little bit as a guest book. So if you just want to sign your name that you were here, I think she'd really appreciate that. So uh, we do have a sign-up sheet. Uh, folks are going to come and read. Uh, we're going to try to go maybe to write up about 4 o'clock and then have a time for a toast and then some mingling time for people to kind of talk and, and uh, have more informal conversations. So with that, I think Angela and I, want, and, and, and I want to thank Audrey, who's out in the hallway, but also Hadara for helping put this event together calling our students, um, letting everyone know what was happening uh, on very short notice. And so, Angela, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, lead us off. Okay. Hello, everyone. This mic is just for recording, so if you, you need to do this if we need to get louder for you for any reason. I'm Angela Elam, the producer and host of New Letters on the Air, and I asked to go first because I wanted to read a poem from a 1996 winter edition of New Letters magazine. This is when I started at New Letters. And I remember reading this poem, and I really didn't know Michelle at this point in time. So um, I'm, when, when I read it years later, Michelle and I used to take these long walks together. We both love gardening and nature, and we'd go out and take these walks. And somehow we started talking about becoming middle-aged and how difficult it is. And then I started telling her about this poem I read years ago 
And she turned to me, and I described it, and she said, Angela, that's my poem. And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, God, I forgot. So anyway, here we are. Cassiopeia at noon, and I guess I, most of you probably know, Michelle loves mythology. So Cassiopeia was one who told Poseidon that uh, she was more beautiful than the sea nymphs, and he got mad, but it's a constellation, and she's upside down in the air for part of the year as a, you know, um, because she did something wrong. All right. <clears throat> Cassiopeia at noon. The gaze is no longer leveled at me, just another aspect of landscape. I am round and bluff as the antediluvian hills across the lake, anonymous as this water maple, our compass of shade and dry towels. Now I see how I have hurried for years from doorway to doorway, like someone caught in a downpour. Since I was 12, it was duck and cover, chica chica, Catholic girl hugging books across her chest under surveillance. It's easy here in obscurity, room to stretch my sand-smeared legs, let my suit gape where it will, unwind the generic gray hairs like roads out of town. So long, so long, soon I shall be invisible. And I have to say that Cassiopeia at noon ended up in her second book, Understory. And I still think it's gripping. And in a way, it follows the thread all the way up to her fifth book, Among the Gorgons. And I'm thrilled somebody else. Sorry, I'm supposed to keep it light. I don't want to get choked up here. Somebody else is going to be reading that later. So you can think of that. And I'm going to turn it over to Hadara, who's going to introduce the next reader. And I don't mean to be obtrusive, but I'll be adjusting this mic to make sure it's the right height for everybody. And we don't, it'll end up, we don't need a whole marching band up here. Okay. Just, just hang for a second. Um, we have Elizabeth Dodd now. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me OK in the back? Um, thanks to Tom for letting me know that this was taking place this afternoon. Uh, I teach at Kansas State University down the road. And I've known um, Michelle all of my adult life. I met her when I was about 18. Uh, and we were both at Ohio University. Um, so we go way back. And I would like to read A Sunday in God Years. Like someone trying to nap in a room with a glaring terrarium, God rolls over. But before he resumes his dream where he's a lover decked out in a sunbeam, he glances at the blue planet he made, at continents crashing and mountains popping up, and sheets of dirt settling in streams, and streams settling in oceans that slide back like bed covers, and after stacks of pressing epochs, give birth in an outcrop to this ragged chunk of limestone I plucked from a wall fading into the woods of northern Kentucky, Ordovician, half a billion years old. It was the common rock of my childhood, what we pried from yards and pulled from creeks to flush out crawdads scuttling underneath. That's an hour's drive and 40 years ago, on the north side of the Ohio, River Jordan, promised land. Fine heft, a good fit to my hand. The rock's finger notches are the curves of river bends on a map. It's shaped like Kentucky. And here's the turn the river takes, weighed in the water. On its way north from Maysville, here's a cove where a runaway could hide, her child slung in a shawl, studying the flows until the moon set and she could plunge across the bobbing ice to board Sweet Chariot, the train of trudging, cornfields, torches, disquieting towns, huddling in root cellars by day, then in the hull of a midnight boat slipping across Lake Erie. The rock I slid from the wall was stacked here by a slave. And slaves felled trees, broke sod, and cut the stone for foundations they couldn't own. 
Up on the ancient hill, the grand old house they built is solitary now. The clutter of shacks for those who worked, snow and swelter, blaze and night, have long been erased as eyesores, although the played-out double-wides along the road tell a revised story. And as for me, a middle-aged white woman, I didn't have to care who'd notice me here, helping myself to these grainy eons plunder embedded with the trails and shells of creatures seen by no eye, although carelessly glanced long ago through warm, shallow seas by a younger son. Next we have John Messner. And while John's coming up here, I've got to tell you, a Sunday in God years, the cover, we have the artist out in the, in the audience. <laughs> so I will also be reading from uh, the book, A Sunday in God Years. I'm going to read the poem, Birthday. Birthday. A current strokes the pear tree and a fall of petals feathers the asphalt and confettis my hair. The afternoon is full of exuberant ruin, of beauty dissolved in the pushing forth of small, hard fruit. In the old story, a sparrow crosses the mead hall, then flies out the other window. That's life, a frantic flight across a crackling room where the clan feasts, harps gleam, and the storm is carefully forgotten. From dark freeze to freezing dark, but in between this gorgeous kingdom, the transitory. Welcome. It's so good to see so many people here. And um, Dr. Vasso, if you're watching, um, I love you. And I'm so glad that you are, um, you've been my teacher and I've learned a lot. And um, this poem I'm going to read, you're going to hear it again. And um, Dr. Vasso is actually someone who taught me that like each person embodies the poem differently. So when you hear this poem again, um, You'll, you'll hear different things. Um, this poem is called Sisters. The moon balances on the peak of the roof as on the sleeve of a magician who has stepped casually from his cloak. From the sleeping porch we rise and switch off the voices of transistor radios in our damp pillowcases. We strap our sandals and sneak off. Madeline trips on a tree stump. Nancy and I hold her mouth to stop the laughter. If in the big brick house someone lifted a blind, he would see only nightgowns or a trick of moonlight hanging in the Japanese maple near his pool. So quietly do we slip beneath the surface, quickening the water into a thousand bright shingles. So alike seem our bodies, we believe, we're tripled under the ringed moon. All night through the rich neighborhood bordering ours, we stitch together patios with our fading footprints under and over fences into each changed stillness that waits to lift its waters onto our shoulders. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm reading Sisters also. And uh, the poem has uh, special significance to me because, uh, weirdly, about 20 years before I came back to school and decided 
to go into the MFA program, I first read this poem in poetry, and it was probably like 94. It came out in 85. But I love this poem. And then like 20 years later, I'm sitting in her class, so I just thought it was like super bizarre and serendipitous at the same time um, because Michelle's tough and um, the poet I am today is because of her. So, sisters, the moon balances on the peak of the roof as on the sleeve of a magician who has stepped casually from his cloak. From the sleeping porch we rise and switch off the voices of transistor radios in our damp pillowcases. We strap sandals and sneak off. Madeline trips on a tree stump. Nancy and I hold her mouth to stop the laughter. If in the big brick house someone lifted a blind, he would see only nightgowns or a trick of moonlight hanging in the Japanese maple near his pond. So quietly do we slip beneath the surface, quickening the water into a thousand bright shingles. So alike seem our bodies, we believe we're tripled under the ringed moon. All night through the rich neighborhood bordering ours, we stitch together patios with our fading footprints under and over fences into each change stillness that waits to lift its waters onto our shoulders. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steph. Um, I'm an undergrad student of Dr. Brasso's, so um, I only had a couple classes with her, but uh, she definitely made an impact, not just with um, her <laughs> determination, but her kindness was uh, very impactful for me. So I'm going to read uh, The Fury That Breaks. The fury that breaks a grown-up into kids, a kid into scattered birds, and a bird into limp eggs. The fury of the poor takes one part oil to two parts vinegar. The fury that breaks a tree into leaves, a leaf into deranged flowers, and a flower into wilting telescopes. The fury of the poor gushes two rivers against a hundred seas. The fury that breaks the true into doubts, doubt into three matching arches, and the arch into in instant tombs. The fury of the poor draws a sharpening stone against two knives. The fury that breaks the soul into bodies, the body into wrapped organs, and the organ into eight doctrines. The fury of the poor burns with one fire in 2,000 craters. Next up, Bob Stewart. Hello, I'm uh, Bob Stewart, editor of New Letters uh, Magazine. Uh, we publish, we not only, we publish Michelle's uh, poems every chance uh, she would uh, give them to me, <laughs> um, and and really uh, uh, is a, is is a great help with the magazine as well. I also want to point something out. You see all these post-it notes. You think it's easy picking a favorite poem, <laughs> but I'm going to uh, I'm going to read an early an earlier poem from the book Understory uh, called Chalk Lineament. He shows up for Easter dinner already skating against chairs. With a bit of supermarket sherry, he says he brought for the table. Frayed cuffs, worn shoes under meticulous polish, ruined a gentleman who is our father. Because it's spring, perhaps, the sun pouring cordials through the branches, or because the aroma of the crown roast my, sister, my sisters and I shut in the oven makes him gracious. He's had nothing to eat since, since his four-year-old granddaughter can coax him into her game. In his darned dark suit, he lies down, spread eagle on the driveway. Among the sloppy, five-pointed stars, the outlines, the others left in their turn. And he allows her to draw chalk, to draw the chalk along his body, her biggest project yet. 
along the shoulders, rounding the shoes with their lumpy laces, up the slope of the open leg, the troublesome baggy crotch. She ends where she began, the profile he turns to the blacktop to oblige her. But afterward, he doesn't rise up from his brief death and go about his business, the tar warm against his back, the serious small fingers tracing him are luxuries that soothe him to sleep. When we've laid out the platters and go to call him, call them, she's dropped candies into his hands and pockets, polished stones he pays no mind to. He's intent on filling the pose, the chalked continent, having found himself in the suburbs, inhabiting his own ghost at last. Thanks. Marcus Myers. Hello. I'm going to read one from A Sunday in God Years uh, titled Flying with the Eyes of a Satellite uh, for TSS. I imagine that's Tom Strake. Right? Okay. How quickly looking is not enough. How soon beauty quickens the longing to slip my fingers inside a satiny pleat of cloud, slide my tongue on the vertebrae of mountains where lakes dimple the valleys and take the furred slopes in their hushed mirrors. Here a delta tastes the first reach of salt. An obliging bay accepts the gentle onslaught of the sea's bare breast, and a thrust of sandbar softens far away. Above earth a hundred miles, we know what gods know of love, remotely, with only the eyes. Such cool and thorough knowing satisfies theorists, perhaps, or the terribly good. But we're a mess of plasma and flesh, ruby electric storms as we bloom new galaxies and taste the body's knowledge. Thank you. Michelle cha shared this poem with me before the book came out. Uh, I teach mythology in the English department, and she wanted to know what I thought about the suffering of Gorgons. For 17 years, I was caught in the surf, drubbed and scoured. I snatch a batch and be jerked down again, dragged across broken shell and shingle. I loved it. Mostly the need, how I fed the frantic. I skipped into the sea, certainly not a girl, but I could still turn a head or two. They took the foam between my thighs. Then it was over. Hiss of a wick snuffed with spit. The sea had trotted off. I stood in the stink of flapping fish. At first it stung. A galaxy of dimes eyed my sag and crinkles and dismissed me like a canceled stamp. But something tugged at me. Silver braids weaving and weaving themselves, and either the path was shrinking or I was getting bigger, for soon the way was just a hair, that extra bit of wit a grandma leaves on her chin to scare the boys, and, and it led me into a crackling like a wood stove with laughter. A landslide opened a seam of rubies, and we stepped inside. Okay, I'm probably violating all things about poetry by bringing props. <laughs> but uh, my name is Tina Nimi, and I am a geology professor here in the Department of Geosciences at UMKC. And I want to read a poem um, that is called South Dakota Field Trip. And the subtitle is In the Titanothere Beds of the White River Badlands. I, so I did bring a visual of what a titanothere is, and part of his uh, humorous. <laughs> Nowhere in the world could you find a word. Constellations swim overhead, nameless and ungodded. 
No one complained about the weather's same old, same old recorded just the same in strongholds of ice and stone stacks that wrote the epics of the epochs. India hankered after Asia in quivers, and the Himalayas were born and born. Hawaii's nipples steamed in the ocean. Florida lay rippling beneath shallow seas, dreaming of fountains and skies that streamed, cranes, kites, and pink flamingos. And here, savannas rose and spread their ample grasses for the mouths of the earliest grazers we dig for among a thousand gray knuckles the badlands. Not a bird, not a whining truck nudges the quiet. Even the wind is soundless, leaning against me, its huge roundness as I choke a clump of shale, coax it from its dusty stone clothes, and until it reveals itself as a bone. Here are the chalky caves where the blood wield. The smooth plain, the cortex, its enameled ribbon like porcelain. The skull is longer than my arm, longer, but as we brush and try to draw it out, the skull crumbles and slides back into silence. D bigger than a bread truck, ugly as a truck wreck, these big mothers nursed their humongous young here for millions of years, though here wasn't yet here. Each spring silkened with the smell of milk and we're gone for millions before we climb from trees, children gripping, gripping our backs and tried the page laid upon two familiar skies. Hi. Um, I've been fortunate enough to spend some time with Michelle in recent weeks, and I can tell you her sense of humor is as sharp as ever. Um, we've had some of the best laughs I've ever had, actually, in, in the past weeks, and it's, I guess, no surprise that Michelle would still have her wicked sense of humor in the trenches. It's not surprising, but it's still amazing. And it's maybe the thing I've always loved most about her is she's got that, that profound depth to her, but this really quick wit. Um, I've always been pleased. There's a poem that she sort of offered to me in, in God years. It says, For Christy. Um, and in the title, uh, The Sad Book of Fun, sort of marries that, those sensibilities in her, the sadness and the fun, they always go together, don't they? I love you, Michelle. At sunset, you hear a few coughs like aircraft killing their engines, and overhead thousands of slow bombers, the crows, are cruising in. Some disturbance in the suburbs or the farther farms sends them here on schedule to drop cause and tar the bald trees with their cheer campaign and we have to face whatever it is they say, we understand. Hello. Um, <clears throat> um, Professor Busso uh, is probably, has one of the largest influences on my on me in poetry and she really got me to take poetry seriously and I remember growing more in one of her classes than I did in any other year of my life and so I'm going to read one of the first poems of hers that I that I really remember reading and so it's called Persephone and I read it in the river sticks I think I want to say but so I'm trying to recreate that experience you feel drunk with gorgeousness filled up on foods you wouldn't touch, overripe pears that dribble down your chin, cheese as pungent as the warmth of animals and sour bread smeared with tomatoes and garlic. Already you've caught yourself eyeing the village boys in from the fields. One takes his tunic to his sweaty brown face. Even his lips are sunburnt. And then slowly to his neck, he knows you're watching. If he leaves the shirt hanging from the cart, you will steal away with it. What a heady pillow it would make. 
all this jostling in the market, you've lost count of how many strangers have touched you, your hands sticky with coins, your ears ringing with the clamor of chickens. Freckling your arm, the sunlight stamps out your winter, but how you admired him, his body like a blade of frost, his head lifted above his ledgers, like a moon in the caves, he knew the silvered end of every story, and when he laughed, it seemed he could hear into the deepest passages where white moss and salts grew into sculpture, and hidden waters tickled dimly as clocks. Tonight, why not take this boy up the hillside with you? And as he sleeps, a heavy leg flung over his hips, you can look down on the village, where it is never truly quiet. A baby cries to be nurse, and the granary mice chew into the sack and a torrent of corn rains over them. The face of an owl glows in the rafters, but yours is brighter drenched with dew, you lie remorseless as a river unraveling over and under an open sky. Thank you, man. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Thank you. Um, it's really hard to summarize. Uh, how I feel about Michelle, but I feel like I'm still learning things she was teaching me years ago. I feel like even now I'm still learning from her, um, so I'm very grateful. This is called uh, The Height of Summer. It's from Trembling Air. There's an epigraph. Old death is so beautiful, so very beautiful. We will die together, I know. Zelda Sayre, letter to Scott Fitzgerald, 1919. The secret to picking blackberries is eating them at once. Bike in the grass, poison ivy lapping your knees, plunge your hand in after the sweetest, shiniest multiples. Time is won only in the lust of now. The lovers are drunk in bed at the plaza. Luscious daughter of an Alabama judge, charmed young writer from snowy Minnesota. Their quick bodies shine with the Ungent, unguent of urgent love. I want to praise their callow confidence in the future, praise the ooze of headlong minutes that sweeten the taste of berries and the dark juice suspended with the seeds of what becomes of us. Michelle, I wanted, you, I wanted to remind everybody that you're not only one of the great practitioners of poetry, but also you're a great theorist. And when I say theorist, what I mean is you're not, you're, you'd never flinch from the big questions, including the, the uh, biggest question, the scariest question about poetry, why? <laughs> why are we doing this? <laughs> why does the world need new poems? When I look at those questions, I flinch. But thanks to you, I've also been able to reach for your book, Writing Poems, where you have written the following. Writing poems is nearly as old as humanity itself. Poetry is so interwoven with the human story that we can follow its origins into the dimmest reaches of our roots. We can easily imagine how not long after we began to structure the sounds that we could make into the world of language, we began tinkering with that language, making it memorable, making poems. The earliest generations of poets played with poems, made discoveries, and invented new ones, as did the next generation and the next, all the way down to us. People from cultures all over the globe trace their origins through poems, from Iceland to Cameroon, on ricky tables in apartment complexes, around campfires in windy plains, in some 5,000 human languages. People use poems to express who they are, what they believe, what they have done, and most of all, what it feels to be alive. Ezra Pound wrote, make it new. 
The very simplicity of his statement tells us how fundamental the new is to making poems. Though human truth may reach back millennia, we will always need new poems. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to make a, just a little break here to remind everybody that we've got a display over here. Those of you on Facebook can't see it, but we've got a display of Bookmark Press books that Michelle helped edit. So all of those in that rack over there are books that she worked on for other writers. And then we also have her writing poems. There are five editions. The latter one has she edited with Hadara, but they all have different poems within them. It's, it's really pretty magical. Magical. So I just wanted to interject that so you'd know. Um, hi, I'm Steve Dilks. I've been at UMKC since 1997, and Michelle, from day one, decided that she had to teach me too, and uh, in, in addition to her students. And what she decided to teach me was that I had to teach poetry. Um, and so I teach the British Literature Survey course, and I do teach poetry, but I'm still learning how to teach it. Um, but Michelle, she came to my class one time, I still have a vivid memory of this, and I had been teaching the Wasteland, T.S. Eliot, um, and I'd spent three days talking about context, talking about what London was like in 1922, talking about the consequences of the war. Michelle came along, I invited to come and help teach the poem, and she sat at the front of class and read it from beginning to end. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you, Michelle. And so that became actually a defining uh, difference in the ways in which uh, we, we approach um, um, the teaching that we do. And I constantly refer back to that moment because I learned so much from trying to emulate what Michelle does with her voice. Uh, this poem I'm going to read is from Trembling Air. And uh, it came out in 2000, and uh, the poem, and then the, the volume came out in 2003. Um, Donna, who, my darling wife Donna, um, sent this poem to her, her father, who's a research chemist. And he responded that it was the most brilliant um, analysis he'd ever seen of how chemistry is important to poets and how poets, great poets, understand chemistry. So uh, you'll, you'll understand that when I read. I'm holding in my hand the skin of a calf that lived 600 years ago, translucent skin that someone stretched on four strong poles, skin someone scraped with a moon-shaped blade. Here is the flesh side. It understood true dark. Here is the hair side that met the day's weather, the long-ago rain. It is all inscribed with the dark brown ink of prayer, the acid galls of ancient oaks, though those reds, deluxe rivulets that brighten the margins, are cinnabar ground to a paste, another paste of lapis lazuli for the, me, these medieval skies, and for flowering meadows or a lady's long braids, the yellow arsenic Orpiment, whose grinding felled the illuminator's boy's assistants like flies, or like Kermes, insects whose pregnant bodies gave pigment, and the goose who supplied quills, the horse its hair, and flax, the fine strong thread that held the folded skins into a private book stamped with gold for a king. Hey everybody. Hey Michelle. Um, I'm going to read a deep cut from a book <laughs> that was published from the year I was born. So this poem was probably written before I was even conceived. Um, and <laughs> take, a, take a look at this babe. Um, but in all seriousness, I love you, Michelle, and I couldn't be more grateful to know you and for everything. This is called The Visible Man. For Bartolomo, 
for Bartolomeo Martello. After the anesthesiologist took you under, cupping your face like a swim master teaching you to swim backwards, did you swim back to Campania? At the inn, halfway between villages, the tables are set. Your aunts flick their petticoats and talk softly beside the arbor. Swinging from every tree along the road are paper lanterns that signal one another with the lightest breeze. You walk beneath, peeling an orange, careful to keep the rind whole. When you can no longer tell the lanterns from the village or the faint music from the tune you carry, you twist the peel back into an orange and throw it over your shoulder for good luck in America. When I was a child, we had a toy with transparent skin called the Visible Man. In surgery, his organs snapped out and we arranged them on the floor according to whim, as if the body's form were accidental. Though of different colors and shapes, the organs seemed the same. None slid from your fingers or bled at a touch, but if a part was gone, the heart carried off for a monopoly piece. The man with see-through skin looked awkward, someone with a missing tooth caught before the camera. Later, my mother told me about Michelangelo and how he once lifted the intestines out of a cadaver and lifted them out. Yards and yards kept unfolding a road map that never folded the same again. I am so happy you've come back to us. The heart is heavy and the liver a burden. Because the lungs are easiest to lift from the body, they were called the lights. Now that they've taken one from you, you're lighter still and your voice thinner as though you would talk like some noise through the trees. One breath keeps you drifting away from us and the ground as we jump up to pull you down and secure you to the visible world. I'm really grateful to be here today, Michelle. And I picked uh, the book or the poem, The Sad Book of Fun, also, um, because I remember sitting in workshop with Michelle one day when she said that she was going to write a poem with this title, and I thought, I'm not going to like that poem, because I didn't <laughs> like the title, and I couldn't figure out why. And then when I picked up A Sunday in God Years and found it pretty much smack in the middle, um, I was really blown away and surprised with how much I loved it. So The Sad Book of Fun for Christy. At sunset, you hear a few coughs, like aircraft killing their engines, and overhead thousands of slow bombers. The crows are cruising in. Some disturbance in the suburbs or the farther farms sends them here on schedule to drop cause and tar the bald trees with their cheer campaign. And we have to face whatever it is they say we understand. Thank you. Hi, I'm me, um, Hadara Barnadov. Um, I wanted to say um, before I read one of Michelle's poems how wonderful it is to hear her poems um, across books. Um, their, their sounds are just gorgeous and edible and her verbs are so exciting. Um, I, I think of what you said, Lindsay, about the poems being inhabited differently in the body, and I hear the life force in her poems coming to us again and again through our lungs, through our breath, through our mouth. So I wanted to say thank you for um, reading her work and allowing me to witness it. It's gorgeous. Um, and I do hear Dickinson in here, in this uh, Archipelagos of Snow, uh, for Michelle, my colleague, um, collaborator. A 
a dear friend and fellow poet, archipelagos of snow. The little house climbs from winter, afraid of its own weakness. The door, the cedar shakes. The knot of leaves in the porch corner drowses in the sunlight. The frost sizzles and rises. It's hard to find a word, a sentence, a handle for the color of the dead grass. Gradually, in spasms of thaw, the grade of the continent takes the snow and other omens. Squirrel nests hang like brains in the trees, rocking, rocking. Behind the house, daffodils, right and reckless. Lori Ellinghausen. Yeah, I'm kind of tall. <laughs> uh, um, Michelle and I bonded pretty much from the get-go over a love of uh, Milton, John Milton, the big guy. And... Uh, Getting the students to commit to a 17-week immersion in Milton can be, it takes a little bit of prodding. <laughs> and, uh, and Michelle was really important for helping fill my classes with um, wonderful students from the MFA program and the undergraduate program in creative writing. And, and we, we've had such great conversations over the years. I'm really grateful um, to you for that, Michelle. And uh, in lieu of reading you some Milton, I'm going to read a poem of, of yours that um, seems to me to have a little bit of the, that Miltonic pastoralism going on. This is an 18th century Boisseau farmhouse from A Sunday in God Years. Leafless tree shadow scribbles the walls and shadows of deflated bushes flood the yard an arrogant silver squalor so pitted and clumped it seems a crowd had barged about, then despaired of raising a response from such a blank and pointless house. Bare weatherboard of equivocal color, snaggletoothed shutters, the place couldn't look better for how bad it looks. Mythic, Faulknerian, with a satisfying smack of the cartoon, a place you'd discover a goat enjoying the taste of mantle. Shirts tugged from an offstage clothesline and flung beside the swayback steps turn out to be chickens, a couple strutting roosters, and a lone peahen. Someone has been working here, patching the roof, carrying it off. A long glaring ladder meets tweezers like its crisp leaning shadow, the two long legs of a huge being who's about to stride over the fields and trees, over the excellent fires made when old wood starts to burn. Thank you. Sylvia Ke Kepler. Kepler. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing your work with us. Uh, Michelle, uh, you've read for us frequently for Riverfront readings, and I'm one of the committee members. And this is from uh, the summer-fall 2016 issue of the I-70 Review. I really enjoy this poem of yours. In your blue books, translate the following items. We may be unreliable, but at least we know how to dress. Cynthia heard the catalog slide off his lap, and now she knew he was groping from his wheelchair for it. Let him grope. Let him answer his own damn phone and feed the goddamn bird. I swear, I've been doing it like this since I was 15. It was the last good summer, 
as the surf banked the beach like the coming bankruptcy. Their mothers gleamed on towels, icy pulp of rum-soaked cherries in doll-tipped glasses. Park outside her house and see if he has a key. Like an oyster sucking the sea through myself, I slept with 47 people by the time I was 31. Fly swat on the kitchen table. You have a strange notion of justice. That weekend at the farm, would her older cousin have shown Lori his jack in the pulpit? In July 1977, we made a show of the hefty bag of pot we'd taken with us to the Cape. They followed Phil behind his restaurant and beat him with a piece of masonry, the blood blaring like clarinets in their veins. Fred blinks like the dog with cataracts who spends the day barking at an empty chair. Patriotism. I will draw a razor along the blue vein of my white wrist, a sting, a sting of red hello. Bob and Lisa ducked out when they saw her coming, halo of hair, Santa Fe jewelry, intent on a meeting. If you were Emerson, would you forget about the couple of abortions before the three kids came, the dogs, the jag, the ski cabin? On holidays, we used to get to the cineplex early. Pay for one, set three or four. May you learn from your mistakes, but only get one chance. After the cookout, they sat in the dark and darker, crusted spoon in the potato salad, Lightning bugs blinking like words they unremembered. Wind shoving the soaked paper plates. Stan was full of good intentions like a sandbox, discovered by ants. We made our way on a gravel road, made centuries ago as stones jumped in our sandals and the heat clapped our heads like pot lids. I wouldn't lie to you, reader. I'm no authority. I um, am the former director of creative writing. The current director of creative writing just left, so as you can see, it's very hard to keep people in this job. <laughs> um, Michelle uh, is another um, of our past directors, and um, I had difficulty picking the poem, so uh, I'm sorry, Whitney, I'm gonna change and now read a different poem than the poem that I... So, so yeah, now you can read the poem you want to read. All right. Um, I'm going to read The Good. And um, I guess I always thought of Michelle and I as um, kind of the good cop, bad cop of creative writing. Um, I always had to be a little careful about um, things that I said that I was unhappy about or people I was unhappy about around Michelle because sometimes those people would then disappear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the tie is for you, Michelle. The good. Their beguiling is Asian dragonflies, the leaping springbok with its lyre horns, or the cello virtuoso who coaxes, coaxes from one elbow and four tight strings, such an ocean of low notes, we feel a sudden happy need for tears. And they're easy to spot, for the good carry themselves with easy radiance. They are spontaneous and simple as springs, bright water that souses sullen rocks. They wear a puzzling air of calm confidence, not cocky or brazen, but assured, like a tree the sun confides with all summer long, or a child 
who has always worn the soft vestments and eaten the golden bread of love. But how they unnerve us, whose boldness is a bristling, through whom, like a coal seam, a vein of badness runs, a snake that zips across meadows and publicly gags down the twitching mouse, and the sun burns through a nuisance of clouds. Thank you. Are you really sure that that tie is such a present for Michelle, Michael? <laughs> uh, he was going to read When I Consider It, but then he made me think of another one that I want to read more. And I, 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 that was a great poem that you chose um, because I was going to talk about uh, baseball a little bit because Michelle's a huge baseball fan, and everybody knows uh, that it is, what it is like to see a transcendent player and that most of the transcendent players end up going to the Yankees or the Dodgers, um, you know. And Michelle could have played, if she wanted to, for the Yankees or the Dodgers. We all know that, don't we? And so it's easy to, <laughs> it's easy to forget when you have a transcendent person around you at what they do because they're not marked by wearing a Yankees uniform or a Dodgers uniform that they are in fact a transcendent person. And so I think that's why we're all here to talk about her. But I do think we forget that all too often. And that kind of person that is in that poem is really the kind of person that Michelle was. We all know that too. Um, so that was what I liked about her and uh, her talent. But also I liked it that she disliked bullshit. And um, that is a trait of somebody who doesn't want to play for the Yankees because there's a lot of bullshit involved with playing for the Yankees. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she was the kind of person that I could call up and say, hey, it, it, does this seems like bullshit to me. What do you think? And she'd say, oh, hell yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> and I'd say, could I explain to you why I think it's bullshit? She said, yes, and I'm going to tell you why I think so too. And those are very refreshing conversations to have occasionally. <laughs> okay? They are necessary to me in my life. Um, so I'm going to read a poem called, uh, called Holler uh, from Understory. Uh, because I liked, I came to writing because I liked, I spent a lot of time in nature when I was young, and uh, Michelle writes really well about nature, and uh, trying to describe what nature's like was one of the reasons that I became a writer. Um, These are my woods, if only because I've never met a soul in here. Place without landscape, these leafy V, this leafy V affords no panorama, no more view than from a drained cistern. Look up, the woods on all sides climb straight up, then open to 30 degrees of sky, as far as the eyelids open. A bird whistle in my head, a brown cricket sentence. No one ever lived here and left behind flint or furrow, only at the trail mouth as if venturing too further in is too scary or tiresome, or marks of people, forlorn parties, beer cans, a knife stump, a sock. I scrambled over a rickrack of trees fallen across the dry creek. I tried to walk when the trail trailed off. Jeans and boots scraping off chunks of bark big as book covers. I hoisted myself over mossy beams that lay waist, shoulder, neck high, and overhead the tide gone out on a broken down dock. A light breeze and now from high in the canopy leaves drift down indifferent. Beech, hickory, oak, dull sycamore spangled together for a time. Frost has bronzed a broad bed of ferns. Tomorrow they'll shrivel into threads. Like all oceans, it's an ocean of time in here. This far in, you'd expect something to happen. But nothing ever happened here, ever and ever. Sediment, erasure, this year's leaves obliterating last. Here are stories, but no plots. I dip my hand in, brown confetti, and deeper, black sponge that tells me whatever it is I'm looking for, I won't find it here. Denise Lowe. 
Hi, I'm Denise Lowe from Lawrence, Kansas. I've, I'm a reader of Michelle Boisseau poems, and I was lucky to uh, review her last book, and I admire so much the high-voltage wit, the uh, wisdom, and the Greek classical drama family relationships. And so I am choosing Mom Was a Cactus. <laughs> the last time we caught sight of her, she thrust her arms out to dive through the space between her bed and the dropped ceiling. Cactuses aren't lovable, but many admire how they thrive on teaspoons of rain and root into the hard pan. They're needling smarts, but creates shade and discourages mouths eager to suck them dry. Keeping afloat nine kids while anchored to a crooning typhoon of a husband and a mother unmoored in a wheelchair. Our mother held tight the wells of her attention until, with a hidey ho and a wave goodbye, she took the tide from under us. Bob and I have many favorite poems of Michelle's. Uh, I've chosen one in A Sunday in God Years. It's the opening poem, Birthday. A current strokes the pear tree and a fall of pe petals feathers the asphalt and confettis my hair. The afternoon is full of exuberant ruin, of beauty dissolved in the pushing forth of small hard fruit. In the old story, a sparrow crosses the mead hall, then flies out the other window. That's life, a frantic flight across a crackling room where the clan feasts, harps gleam, and the storm is carefully forgotten. From dark freeze to freezing dark, but in between this gorgeous, kingdom, the transitory. Those of you who know me know that um, poetry, I have not been blessed with those gifts. So I am always so grateful um, for Michelle's beautiful poetry. And whenever I'm asked to go and address a group of students, whether it's at an orientation or at a student's celebration of their work throughout the year, I always turn to Michelle's poetry um, in an attempt to inspire and um, give the students something to think about. So. Um, through the years, I've probably shared this particular poem dozens of times with students. And um, Michelle, much, much gratitude to you for putting this poem out there. And I hope just a few of the students that I've shared it with um, will be as fierce and feisty as you are. Um, so this is a dog's ours poetica. And um, I always tell students that I hope they will approach their studies um, with this particular dog's uh, approach to life. So. Though its whiskers take the air's temperature and its gritty tongue tastes the marrow of pleasure, though it's rightly proud of its skill in the stock, how camouflaged as a collapsed staircase it catapults at a twitching wing, 
Though all grace and cunning, a cat is no good at poetry. It spits at water and brings you only a dumb tangle of tendon. No, it requires me, slobbery and faithful, strictly disciplined yet eager and modest. I enter a lake without a wrinkle, and what I bring back, secure in my black mouth, is unbloodied, alive, and terrified. There you go. <laughs> well, like a lot of people, um, finding my favorite poem by Michelle was uh, not an easy task. Uh, there are lots and lots of them, so I just kind of dived in. Uh, I've, I've always felt every time I read one of her poems uh, or hear her read one of her poems, either one, that, that um, I'm learning something about how a poem should be. So uh, I'm very impressed. Gratia plena. I didn't feel a spark, a dandelion exploding in seed, a new planet. And I was far from Fra Angelico, Simone Martini, those old masters who always left a cool vessel and spray of lilies to catch the shooting soul. Ave Maria, and in through the window rolls Gabrielle in a gold leaf. Gratia plena, and the pale girl's hands fly up as if to bat away the spidery star lofted toward her. Remember when the happy shuffling of chromosomes began? My face and your shoulder, your mouth against my ear. How we were trying to keep quiet while the whole household conspired to muffle us. Your brother in the kitchen clanking pots for supper. Katie and her cousins banging away on the upright piano. And the guinea pig beside the guest bed squeaking from her cedar chip cavern. We tried to keep quiet until we forgot ourselves, the blazing pavilions for our own Virginia reel. And we tumbled down warm dunes to breakers that flung phosphorescent nets about us. Lying back afterwards, face to face in the froth of sheets, we watched the skiff we launched across the horizon through the still rattling household. Kate uh, has taught here. She's one of our alums, and uh, she's also a Bookmark Press author. And uh, she called me right before this started and asked me if I would read for her. And I thought, how perfect. She picked the last poem in the last book. So here we go. <clears throat> and in a minute, I'm going to get Kevin Mullen, our, our camera guru over here, to uh, come and unhinge the camera for a little bit and show you guys so Michelle can see you and you can wave at her and say hello um, before we lose any more people to classes because I know some people have come and gone. Okay. The voyage of the sentence begins with a cough, a clank of a spoon, like silver threads worked into tapestry, a Hollywood notion of voyage flickers and is launched. Big ship, brass, paper streamers, hankies waving as the horns batter the air, and a steward ducks into a little closet where he keeps his smokes. A short break before they start ringing for scotch, locksmiths, foot rubs, he misses Argentina and the acuity of the barbers, but his buddy Ernesto is dead how many years now? He spotted long sideburns razored into twin boots of Italy, aiming at his chin. But that's wrong. No service crew or salvers, no dinner jackets. Easing out on the tide, a vessel christened Eva, or Eva, slips past the point into open water. How could I know? How could anyone but a saint know that, I, that as I was rolling into the dark seas of grief, a small craft was being built in me? And now by the time the nets are spooled over laps for mending and the singing begins, the frank exchange between moon and moonlight is amping up. So, Michelle, I would like to read a poem from Trembling Air. 
And this is a poem about your father, but your father and my father both died in the same year. And I heard you read shortly after this came out, and I know it's about your father, but I've always thought of my father. And it's a, another great library, Burns. And his dying was the conflagration of a great library. Shouts and cries as engines labor on pump ships in the harbor. Water clanks against the flames and archives where murals curl and hiss. Its Laurentian staircase quiver, quavers, grillwork fusing and buckling as the fire breaks out and rushes at the crowd. We stumble back over crates and hoses against warehouses, faces glowing as we grope for each other's sleeves. Like reverse snow trembling on vague currents, cinders drift into our hair and weep from our eyes. A few manuscripts on crackling parchment are hustled out, an oil painting, some crumbling histories. The stamp collection begun in 1938 with three stamps affixed at the clean kitchen table, that apartment on Reading Road where an all night Hardee's now stands. The tricky curtain of fire shimmies shelf to shelf, a steady hunger that streams down gangplanks into corners up spines. Leather, paper, ink go in a gulp. The union's blunders at Shiloh, a speech from a Midsummer Night's Dream. He was Oberon at Walnut Hills High. Johnny Vandermeer's back-to-back -back no hitters, a joke about God golfing with a priest, a poem by Hausman, and where to find a drink Sunday morning. And what to me is the loss of Aristotle's dialogues or Aeschylus's Prometheus next to the sound of my father's voice one more time. Um, from New Jersey, so hard to choose. We return to a plain sense of things. Kind of my favorite, except I just, I, why glimpsed? Why the swans glimpsed through the rushes? Done. <sighs> so much pressure. And then the white gloves fold the flag, falling snow shut inside, and hand it to my mother-in-law. Good gray coat, 52 years married. Too late now. Where silence ends, it stays. That's the clicking of the mouse. He told his children he loved them or touched them with affection, except he never told his children he loved them or touched them with affection, except a scouring of the head or when grown a handshake, a tap on the arm. He never apologized. He couldn't recite Shakespeare wouldn't stretch out with an espionage novel or sing in a piano bar tunes from Gigi. He played the accordion with his wife at weddings, led a polka expertly among the quick couples, his face nearly flickering with pleasure. When he read it was the Stevens Point Journal. Sales and obituaries, he learned to trade. He didn't go to college or to high school. Sent off as a farmhand at 12, he sent money home that couldn't save the farm. And once in 1935, he watched all night from an open freight car the billowing immaterial of the Northern Lights. He didn't spend the war at a desk job, perfecting pranks on the base's PA system. He didn't break down, never lost a job. He measured twice and cut once. He built a house. He built a bigger house. He was a foreman. Excuse me. He was foreman. He was union. He never took his children to the circus and riled the lions with his echoing roar. He didn't climb the trellis to the porch roof and wail in the windows at his wife. He never watched his sons pitch Little League or appeared in the stands at wrestling matches or bragged about them at bus stops. He was an officer in the St. Joseph Altar Society. He paid cash for all the weddings of his daughters he didn't encourage, and he didn't stagger around the motel pool in his socks. 
And in later years, if he won a few hands of pinochle against a visiting son, he might begin to talk, matter-of-factly, about Omaha Beach, June 9, 1944, his company of engineers landing where the surf was still bobbing, the sand still festering with burst cartons of bodies, and over them he lugged his gear, fuel lines for tanks, fresh grease for the machines. I, will, I, want, I want Kevin to come up here so he can pan the audience, and I want to point out, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. He wasn't planning this. Anna, wave at your mom. <laughs> That's Anna Boisseau. And then I also want Tom Stroik, her husband, to say hey. And everybody at once, please tell Michelle hello and that you love her. We love you, Michelle. And see all those bookmark press books she worked on? Now we can see it because you can pan over there and see everybody. That's a bunch of books. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to you because I think we have one more festivities. Yeah. One more. So Audrey and, and friends and company back there are um, handing around some um, sparkling water. There's also coffee. Um, um, and I'll, I'll start by saying, um, or finish by saying two things. One, one should never check your email, but I'm glad I did because Michelle wrote to me during this. Um, and I'd written her the other day telling her we were doing this, and uh, she said, finally finishing this email, which means she's irritated with me, um, feeling decidedly weird about it. <laughs> Woke up early thinking about how it's light up like a Monty Python skit. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> yes, Michelle, we know. And that's one of the reasons we're doing it, because we wanted you to know how much we love you and um, how much we've appreciated everything that you've given us. Uh, we're handing around some Pellegrino, uh, um, and, and in part because, as you know, Michelle loves Italy and all things Italy. Um, Italian art, Caravaggio, Dante, and if you were listening to those poems carefully, there are references to Italy in many ways, as well as the medieval world and the ancient world. Um, as my mentor in the department, and I had the good fortune of having a chair who was smart enough to give me the best mentor ever, thank you Tom Strike. Um, she not only coached me through promotion and tenure, she regularly encouraged me to go to Italy. She thought it was part of my educational experience that was incredibly lacking. So on my first trip, she insisted that I drink Prosecco in Rome. I did. And most of you know the rest of that story. Um, I don't drink even fizzy water anymore. And I would have loved to have been able to offer you a glass of Prosecco today. Uh, but this room is not a university-sanctioned drinking <laughs> space. So we're going to have the second best Italian sparkling drink. And I'm going to ask you to raise your cup to Michelle. And consider these lines from the end of the inferno, when Virgil and Dante are ascending out of hell. And if you didn't know, the Divine Comedy in the original Italian is bathroom reading and the Stroik Boisseau household. Um, that's when I knew I'd met people that I was going to love forever, that they're going to sit there and read uh, Dante <clears throat> and think. And before I recite these, these lines and memorize those poems, um, I want to share with you that one of Michelle's very last road trips was north of the river to take in the solar eclipse. And again, if you were listening really carefully to those poems, how many times, not just nature, but the elements of the skies are embedded in her poems. And so this is what made me think of Dante again. <laughs> And she went on the solar eclipse so that she could view the firmament. Dante writes, My guide and I entered that hidden road to make our way back up to the bright world. We never thought of resting while, while we climbed. We climbed, she first and I behind until through a small round opening ahead of us, 
I saw the lovely things the heavens hold. And we came out to see once more the stars. To Michelle, Magistra et Poeta, with our thanks for your many gifts, may you always be able to see the stars and lead us there. We love you, Michelle. Cheers. 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 Cheers.